Hi friends, how are you today? I hope you're having a wonderful day so far. My name is Bailey Sarian and today is Monday, which means it's murder, mystery, and makeup Monday. If you are new here, hi. My name is Bailey Sarian and on Mondays I sit down and I talk about a true crime story that's been heavy on my noggin and I do my makeup at the same time. If you're interested in true crime and you like makeup, I would highly suggest you hit that subscribe button because I'm here for you on Mondays. I'm out of breath. <laughs> I was thinking I should like get some clothes because <laughs> some of the common comments I see when I read my YouTube comments, it's like people a lot of the times think I, I'm, I already did this story. And my thought is maybe it's because I'm always wearing like black or gray, my hair is always the same. Maybe because I just always look the same. Do you think that's why? Because none of the stories I've uploaded on my YouTube has been a duplicate. I've never put up a story twice, but I see the comments all the time. And I'm like, is it because I'm just like, I look the same? I guess so. Help me help you. Hopping in here because today's video is sponsored by HelloFresh. What is HelloFresh you ask? Well. Get mouth-watering seasonal recipes and fresh, pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door with HelloFresh, which is America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh makes cooking at home fun, easy, and affordable. HelloFresh offers so many recipes to choose from each week to help you break out of your recipe rut, because let's admit it, right now, not even right now, I just think this is an adult thing where it's just like, what do you eat? <sighs> Anyways, with HelloFresh, it cuts out stressful meal planning and prepping so you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in just like about 30 minutes. Or even they have a 20 minute like option. It's called the quick and easy option. Quick and easy. It's my middle name. With HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients, that means there's less prep for you, okay? And then there's less wasted food. Cause you know when you have to go buy a bunch of ingredients and it's like, I'm never gonna use this again. Like when am I gonna use cloves? How often do you? Don't get me started. I love HelloFresh because it's super easy. It breaks down the recipe step by step, visual. So if you're like a visual person, you see it and you're like, okay, I have to do that. Hey, some of us pictures, we need them. With HelloFresh, it's just given me a lot more confidence being in the kitchen. Normally I start kitchen fires. I've mentioned this before, but like I haven't started a kitchen fire. Knock on wood, there's no wood here, but I haven't started one since we moved. Well, does that count? Was in the oven. Right now you can go to hellofresh.com and use my code Sarian12 to get 12 free meals, including shipping. Get your grub on, okay? A big thank you to HelloFresh for partnering with me on today's video, but most of all, big thank you to you guys because without you, I wouldn't be making this video right now. Okay, now back to my no makeup face. <laughs> Warning, the following presentation is intended for mature audiences. It contains graphic descriptions of crime scenes, adult dialogue, and strong language. Viewer discretion is advised. This week, we are going to talk about a serial killer. I'm using silver clips this time because last week you all thought I was a fairy. So let me use silver, okay? But this week, we're gonna talk about a serial killer. It's been a while since we've talked about a serial killer. Buckle in kitty cats because what the fuck? Today's story takes place in April of 1971. The location? Washington, D.C. 13-year-old Carol Spinks, she was in seventh grade and she was one of eight siblings. Um, and she also had an identical twin sister. Her and her twin sister, like no one could ever tell the two apart. And they would constantly play jokes on other people, like pretending to be the other sibling, you know? Twins, I don't know what it's like because I don't have a twin, but it seems fun, I would think. I don't know assumptions. But Carol was said to be a little bit more quiet and she was like the shy one out of the bunch. And at the age of 13, she was pretty petite. She was around four feet tall and she was just a very small girl for 13. You get it. On Sunday, April 25th, Carol and her sisters are inside of their, their home and they're just playing. Their mother comes in. She comes in, she comes up to them. She's like, hey, I'm just gonna step out really quick. I'm gonna go visit one of our relatives like down the street. You guys stay inside the house. Don't open the door for anyone and do not leave the house. And they were like, okay, you know. And then the mom leaves, right? Okay. So the kids are just inside the house playing and then 
someone's knocking at the front door. Knock, 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 knock. They peek outside and they see it's their older sister who no longer lives at the home, the family home. She's nearby visiting some friends. And one of the sisters opens up the front door. The sister who was knocking was like, hey, can, can one of you guys just go to the store for me really quick? It'll just be like a quick little favor if you could just pick this thing up for me. And the kids are like, no, mom told us that we can't leave the house. We're not allowed to go anywhere, so no. So they shut the door and they go back to doing whatever it was that they were doing inside the house. But the sister is still outside at the front door knocking, knocking, just knocking. Then she starts pounding and it's getting damn annoying. So Carol, she gets up, she opens up the door and she's like, fine, I'll go to the store for you. What is it that you want? You know, she, Carol, she ends up doing this favor for her sister and she heads out to the 7-Eleven store. Well, first of all, why the sister just couldn't go herself, we don't know, we don't know things we don't know. But the 7-Eleven was just half a mile from their home and it was like a pretty easy walk. So Carol heads out. Now, while Carol is on her walk, she actually runs into her mom who sees Carol and is super pissed. She's like, didn't I tell you not to leave the house? Like, what are you doing? Why are you out here? You know, and Carol, explains the situation and her mom is like, okay, I'll watch you to make sure you get into the 7-Eleven safe, but I better see you back at the house and like don't stop anywhere else. So Carol's mom, she just stops and she watches Carol walk into the 7-Eleven store. And once she gets inside their safe, the, her mom takes off and, and does her thing. Back at the home, some time is going by. Okay, like 30 minutes go by and the siblings are like, you, wh where the heck is Carol? It shouldn't take this long to go to the 7-Eleven. Where'd she go? They go outside and they start asking the neighbors, like, have you seen, have you seen Carol? No, we can't, we don't know where she went. Then they go down to the 7-Eleven store and they're like, have you seen our sister Carol? They went in there pretty often. So the cashier, the guy working there was like familiar with the family and whatnot. So the cashier is like, yeah, I just saw her. She came in, she got some stuff and then she left. So they're like, okay, maybe she's back at the house or maybe she's back at the house. So then they go back to the home and Carol's still not there. She's just like nowhere to be seen. And they're kind of getting worried because they know when their mom comes home, she's gonna be really upset because what was the one thing she told them not to do? leave the house. So some time goes by, still no sign of Carol, but their mom comes home and their mom is like, where's Carol? And all the siblings, they have this like look of worry on their face and they tell their mom that they have no idea where she's at. She hasn't come home. Alentine is Carol's mom. So she ends up calling the police and she's going to, you know, report Carol missing because, um, well, she's missing. Now these shithead police officers, they unfortunately tell her, oh, well, Carol probably just ran away. And then that's it. That's the advice they give her. Click. Alentine knows for sure there's no way in heck that her daughter ran away, okay? She's like, there's no way. Carol would not do that. So she gathers up some of the neighbors to help her look around the neighborhood for Carol. And they ended up searching like pretty late into the night. And unfortunately there just was no sign of Carol. So a neighbor came out and said that earlier that day, they saw Carol, she was carrying a bag with her and like walking home, it seemed. This means that Carol was most likely taken on her walk home from the store or even close to her home, which is scary because it happened right under everybody's noses. But that's really all the information anybody had. Six days end up going by no sign of Carol. And on May 1st, police find on route I-295, it's like near the rear of St. Elizabeth's Hospital, they find the body of Carol Spinks. Carol had cuts and bruises all over her body and there were signs of strangulation. She was fully dressed, but her shoes were missing. Homicide detectives, they have to go to Carol's family. They went to Allentine and they, they tell her like, we found Carol's body and it was just, devastating news to the family. Plus on top of that, a lot of the siblings felt a lot of guilt for letting Carol leave the house in the first place. So a coroner report comes out and it said that Carol suffered wounds to her face, 
neck, and hands. One of the strangest things of all was the fact that there was food that was undigested in her stomach. So medical ex examiners believe that Carol was alive for most of the time that she was missing because of the food in her stomach. Poor Carol was like held hostage somewhere for a couple of days. So the police are now like searching for who this murderer could be, but during this time in Washington, D.C., there were large protests happening, protests against the Vietnam War. So the Capitol was taken over with thousands of protesters, rallies. There was just people everywhere. There were hundreds of people being arrested to the point that they no longer had um, any room to store these people. And they ended up making makeshift camps to arrest the protesters and hold them there. Every available police officer in the district was called in for emergency duty to help handle the protesters and make these arrests. Now because of this, a lot of crimes got buried or just put on the back burner because it wasn't their main priority at the time. So finding Carol's murderer was not top of the list for them, which you think is silly because you think like a murderer would be top of the list, but it just, it wasn't. It got put to the side, which is extremely frustrating to the family. So then July, 1971, two months after Carol was abducted and murdered, 16 year old Darlena Johnson was leaving her house and heading out to her summer job at the local recreation center. Darlena never showed up to work that day. Her mother got a call asking if Darlena would be showing up. And then that's when she realized that her daughter was missing. Her mother calls the police to file a missing persons report. One witness comes forward and says that they saw Darlena in an old black car and it was driven by an African-American male shortly after her abduction. But that really doesn't lead to any to anything. They just thank you for that information. And that's as far as that went. Time passes once again with no answers. This was a little different because in the following weeks, Darlene's mother, she like got a bunch of random, random ass phone calls. Whoever was on the other end wouldn't say anything. They would just like pick up the phone and then just be breathing all heavily like a creep, you know, like, <laughs> and then hang up. Like what a loser, get some hobbies, you know? So she was getting these phone calls kind of every so often. And I don't know if you've ever gotten these phone calls because sometimes I get random phone calls where people just breathe on the phone. <laughs> so I turn it into a competition. I'm like, oh, you're just gonna, you're just gonna breathe on the phone. Okay, I could play this game. And then I start breathing all heavily back. <laughs> I end up turning it into a breathe off, okay? Like you're not gonna win this game. Not the point of the story, creepy breathing, losers get some hobbies. Anyways, but these calls would keep happening, okay? So Darlene's mother would pick up the phone, someone's breathing. But Darlene's mother said that she just had this gut feeling that like it had to do with her, da her daughter. Either her daughter was on the other line and she had nothing that was going to prove that. It was just her gut feeling. But I think it's safe to say, you know, that when your gut feeling tells you something, stupid gut, it's always on point. She she tells police this, but again, there's like really nothing they could do. They're like, okay, do you have any proof? No, your gut is not your proof. But then she received one final phone call, which was a man on the other end who said, quote, I killed your daughter, then hung up. Wait, how did he get the number? Oh my God, I didn't even think about that. Was it someone that she knew? I didn't even think about that. So after she gets this phone call, for good reason, she picks up the phone, calls police, but there was no technology yet that was actually able to help trace the phone call. And again, there just really wasn't anything that the investor investigators could do with this information. They're like, oh wow, we'll take note of that. Okay, but then get this, cause this will piss you off. I'm sorry, but it will. Anonymous caller calls up the police department. This person says that they believe that there was a body alongside the I-295, but for some odd reason, this call just wasn't taken seriously and time went on. Then on July 19th, 1971, an officer spots a body alongside the road of the I-295. Oh, what are the odds of that, you know? Her body was dressed, but without shoes. There were signs of strangulation, but the body had been in this spot for at least 14 to 15 days in the hot sun, 
which led to like serious decomposition and investigators were unable to ID the body based off of their face. Police checked the missing persons report and based off of the report mentioning the clothing that was worn at the time of the disappearance, they were able to ID the victim as Darlenia Johnson. Now, because of this decomposition, they could not fully determine the cause of death, but it's believed to be strangulation. Now, Darlenia was found 15 feet away from where Carol's body was found months prior. I mean, it wasn't until later news came out the, that an anonymous tip had come into the police department. It's like, they didn't want to admit that this happened, you know. They dropped the ball on this, obviously, because the only person who would know that this the body was here would be the killer. So it's believed that this anonymous tip came from the killer, because there's no way like you could spot the body just from driving on the freeway or something. And it was not a spot that you could like easily access. It's like a very strange spot. And it was like a very brave spot to put these bodies because it's like out in the open, it's a busy highway. Like that anonymous tip that came in was most likely the freaking killer. It's just so annoying, isn't it? Time and time again, same fucking thing. I don't know why it's so hard to do your job. July 27th, 1971, 10 year old Brenda Crockett was asked to go to the grocery store, which was about a half a block away from the family home. She was given some money and she headed out. The walk, it like wouldn't have taken that long. Okay, it was just a couple of minutes, but quite some time passes. And when Brenda is gone for over an hour, the family knew something was wrong. So Brenda's mom is getting all, all worried, like where the heck is Brenda at? So she heads out of the house and starts looking for Brenda. While Brenda's mom is out searching, the phone rings back at home. Now Brenda's younger sister, who was only about seven at the time, she picks up the phone. Brenda is on the other end. Now Brenda was crying and said, quote, a white man picked me up and I'm being sent home in a cab. And then the call just ends. A few minutes later, the phone rings again. Now this time, Brenda's stepfather picks up the phone and it's Brenda on the other end again. And he's telling her like, where are you? I can come get you. Just tell me where you are. And Brenda said that she thought she was somewhere in Virginia. And then she asked her stepfather, did my mom see me? And her stepfather is like, what do you mean did your mom see you? If she saw you, she would have gotten you. Then he asked Brenda if the man can come to the phone and he could talk to him really quick. So then he said that he hears heavy footsteps in the background, but then the call just ends. Now it's believed Brenda had asked if her mom had saw her because the whoever the killer was, was trying to get information if they were spotted or, or not, but that was just their theory. They don't really know what she meant by that, but they think that the killer was telling her to ask that question. So the next morning around 5.50 in the morning, a hitchhiker was walking alongside Route 50 near Prince George's County, Maryland. The hitchhiker comes across 10 year old Brenda's body. Brenda was fully dressed, but again, her shoes were missing and she had a scarf which was knotted around her neck. Now after this, families in the area were getting scared, worried, terrified, angry, believing whoever's doing this is gonna come after them, their kids, and police had no movement on these cases. They had no leads. And there was a lot of distrust happening between the community and the police department. The black community voiced that, hey, if these kids were white, I am sure that there would be movement happening or these cases would be considered top priority. Because during this time, there were a handful of other cases that involved white children that were not treated the same, that were solved within a few minutes, not a few minutes, I'm exaggerating, but they were solved, they were making a valid point. Why is there nothing happening on this? But during this time, there were news reporters who would come into the, the neighborhood asking everyone questions, trying to figure out what the story was, what happened to these kids. Like the news, they were reporting on it and the families felt like this is exactly what the police should be doing because they weren't on the street asking questions like the reporter reporters were, they were also kind of unsure of like, 
who to trust. Like, why should I be talking to a reporter about what's going on? I should be telling this to the police. So some time goes by. October 1st, 12 year old Nenemoshia Yates. She was at home in Northeast Washington. Her father asked her to go to the store, which was only one block away. Look, this is in the 70s. It was normal for, you know, kids to go walk to the store by themselves. Yes, the news were reporting they, they were reporting on this, but like not everybody was aware of what was going on. Cause I just know, you know, some of you are gonna be like, well, why would you let your kids walk? Because it's not like it is today, okay? So her father asked her, you know, can you go to the store? It's just grab a couple of things for dinner. Thank you so much. So she agrees and heads to the store. Should only take a couple of minutes. She gets there, she gets the items she needs and she's seen leaving the store and she's walking home. Now, unfortunately, between the store and her walking home, she never made it. And it wasn't even a far walk. So it, it's just like, Whoever this person was, was doing it quick. And then three hours later in nearby Prince George's County off of Route 4, Ninamoshia's body was found. I don't know what the hell is going on. Nobody knows what the hell is going on, but same as the others, she was fully dressed. She was missing her shoes. She also had seemed to be sexually assaulted and strangled. There was one witness report who came forward and said that they th saw her get into a blue Volkswagen, but that led nowhere. But also they found green fibers on her clothing. People are pissed. The media is like reporting on these murders and they're putting pressure on the police to make some arrests. Get their asses in gear, okay? Because it seemed to everybody that they were not doing their best to try and figure out what the hell was going on. They still had no answers. They still had no leads. They had nothing. I mean, they have these green fibers. It's like, do something with it. And on top of that, for some freaking weird reason, the police, they were not connecting all of the murders. They thought it was a separate person doing these, these murders. It just like was a mess. But there was one news source who believed that it was a single killer and they dubbed them the Freeway Phantom because they believed this killer was using the I-295 as their main way to stalk and pick up their victims and then make their escape. The FBI finally steps in. Now they go through all the evidence from the victims' bodies and that's when they realize that all four of the victims had been strangled. They all had their shoes missing and then they all had this green fiber that was found on their body. But the FBI was like, most likely these four murders were committed by the same person. Whoever this person was, was believed to be DC's first serial killer. They haven't had this yet. November 16th, 1971. The body of 18 year old Brenda Woodard was found on the freeway ramp of the Baltimore Washington Parkway. Brenda, she was stabbed multiple times and also strangled. Brenda was fully dressed, but unlike the others, she still had her shoes on. I was reading one report that said Brenda actually had her name written on the shoes and it's believed that's why her shoes were still on because you know, it could like link whoever the killer was back to her. Something that was also different with Brenda was that she had a velvet cloak. No, she didn't. She had a velvet coat placed over her chest, which was believed to not belong to her. In the front pocket of the coat, there was a handwritten note found in it, which had a message on it. And they believe that this message was written for the police. So this note said, quote, this is tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me if you can. Freeway Phantom. Now this note is handwritten. And they're like, okay, what does it mean? They don't seem to be the brightest over there. They're like, oh God, look, a note. What does this mean? Wow, mm, notes. So police you know, they're like, hey, let's maybe get a closer look at this note and let's do like a handwriting comparison and see if that can lead us somewhere. So they do just that. And then they realize the note was actually written by Brenda. They compared it to her handwriting. And the note was also written on her own notebook paper. They, they thought it was odd because there was no sign of stress in the handwriting, which to me was mind blowing. Cause I was like, you can determine stress in handwriting, the things you learn, you know, but they can. So they're looking at their handwriting and they notice that there's no shaking in the writing. It was evenly written and it was very clear, which to investigators made them believe that maybe Brenda knew her killer 
The word tantamount stood out to investigators because it's just not a word you hear people use all too often. No leads, no nothing, but at least they have this note and tantamount, great. 10 months go by and they actually thought that maybe whoever was doing this was gonna stop because 10 months is obviously a long time. <laughs> Okay, great, we determined that. September 5th, 1972, 17 year old Diane Williams went to visit her boyfriend that evening and to get there, she had to take the bus and whatnot. So she did that. After hanging out with him for the night, Diane and her boyfriend, both of them walked together to the bus stop. They waited for the bus to arrive. Her boyfriend hung out with her the whole time, watched her get on the bus. It was like around 11.30 at night and headed home. Now, unfortunately, Sadly, Diane never made it home. Sadly, Diane's body was found like a few hours later on Route I-295 southbound. She was fully dressed, her shoes were missing, but they did find semen on her clothing, like on her jeans. Now, originally investigators assumed, they assumed that the semen was from her boyfriend, but it was later determined to not belong to, to him. Also on Diane, there was a small green fiber found on her. Now they were believing that this green fiber may have come from like inside of a car, but they really weren't sure. So police end up pulling out like their huge file a list of predators and potential suspects. And they're just hoping to try and find like some kind of connection to somebody, right? They come across this local gang named the Green Vega Rapist. These people, they hung around Washington DC in the Maryland area. Now they were known to like kidnap and rape victims in the area. So they questioned some of the members individually. So some of the people that they questioned were like, there's this inmate over at the Lorden prison. This guy might have some information regarding the case, you know, like go talk to him. And then investigators go out and question this inmate. Now this inmate agreed to talk to police and give information with two conditions. If they could help him get a lesser sentence and if he could remain anonymous. So investigators are like, yes, we'll do that because we don't have anything. So they're asking him questions and he seemed pretty credible. So they're like, okay, we're gonna take this guy out on a couple of ride alongs and see if he knows where the victims were dumped. And it will kind of test him to see if he is indeed credible and he's not just making this up to get out of prison, blah, 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 you know? Now this inmate, he was able to describe what the victims were wearing and where they were dumped. But there were some inconsistencies in this guy's story. He might know what's going on, but there's still like things he's not getting right. So they take him out on another ride along. It's like the second time they're out. And while they're driving, they're listening to the radio. So during this time, there was an election going on and one of the candidates publicly announced to the press that they had a break in the case, that an inmate from the Lorton prison had provided information to help get this case closed. Now this candidate, he was mentioning it publicly in hopes to win people's votes because he was harsh on crime and gonna get this solved. Cause that's what a lot of politicians do. They don't necessarily care about the crime, they care about the numbers, especially before an election. So they're in the car, this is on the radio. The inmate hears this, he starts to freak out. I asked you if I could be anonymous. People are gonna figure out it's me. People are gonna know that I'm the one who told authorities this information. So after he hears that, he pulls out from his own fear of being outed and declined further interviews and denied that he ever provided information to the case in the first place. They just keep dropping the ball over and over again because it sounded like like this guy knew who did it or was involved in some way. And I don't know. But then the police were like, nah, he didn't know what he was talking about. And they're like kind of downplaying it because they don't want to seem like they dropped the ball. Does that make sense? It's just such a shit show. So many believe that the Green Vega people, they weren't even involved in these murders in the first place. Okay, because this guy, his confession or whatever, it wasn't consistent, but the Green Vega didn't come out until 1972, which was after when some of these crimes had taken place. Maybe they're not involved. I don't know what they're thinking because it doesn't really seem like they're thinking, but they're looking at other suspects. So they look for another suspect. They come across 58 year old Robert Askins, who was a computer technician. Now Robert over here, yeah, he had been previously um, charged with abducting and raping a 24 year old woman in Washington. So with one of his victims, Robert had the victim write a note and it was like very similar to the situation with Brenda. 
the one, the one with the note. They also discovered that Robert seemed to use the word tantamount pretty often. When investigators went and like asked his colleagues at the National Science Foundation where Robert was employed, they informed investigators that Robert used this word tantamount pretty often in his speeches. So a search warrant was issued and documents and stuff was like gathered from his home, but there was no physical evidence that was found that linked Robert to the crimes. I mean, can you really convict someone just based off of a word? They had nothing on Robert and he was never linked to it. Now, later on in life, Robert ended up dying in the Federal Correctional Institution in April of 2010 at the age of 91 because he was arrested or he was in prison um, for two DC area abductions and rapes in the mid 1970s, but he denied that he had any role in the freeway phantom killings. I don't know, I get so torn because I feel like if you're already in prison, wouldn't you just confess at that point? What would he have to lose? But then I, I mean, that's not always the case, but it's like, why wouldn't you? Like, it just sounds like it could have been him, okay? Because I don't know, the word, I don't know. They just got nothing here, okay? <laughs> So then, the, then there were some other suspects. Their names were Edward Sullivan and Tommy Simmons. Now these two bastards were two ex-cops who were arrested for the murder of 14-year-old Angela Barnes. Angela Barnes was originally thought to be a victim of the freeway phantom. Authorities determined that Angela, she was not linked to the serial killer, but it's like a real suspicious because she was found within the same area as the other victims and it was around the same exact time that the other victims were found. So you would think that she would be considered part of this, the serial killer, right? I mean, right? Hello? But Angela was found with a gunshot wound, which is like why investigators believe that she was not a victim to the serial killer because none of the other victims had gunshot wounds, but the age range, the location of the victim, the timing, it was very similar. When word came out that the two ex-cops had murdered Angela, now this came out into the community and everyone's like, see, this is, this is why we can't even trust the police because it's them. It's them. Like, who do you trust? Why these two were not considered to be involved with the other murders is just like beyond me. I mean, I guess, I guess the gunshot wound makes sense, but like, that's it, that excludes them. I just like couldn't find a concrete answer as to why they were not connected. I found a lot of assumptions as to why they were not connected and I just don't freaking know. Kind of seems like they could be though, right? So over time, this case ends up going cold. And then in 1987, a new sergeant came into the district and she started to just work on cold cases. So she opens up this one. She pulls out all the books, pretty much track everything when it comes to this case. It has lists and lists of just evidence that they pulled, the dates, what it was, all that stuff. So she opens up the books and she realized that a lot of the evidence, 99.9% .9 of the evidence had been destroyed with dates as to when the item was destroyed. So you know when they went to the crime scenes and they picked off like the green fibers, the, the freaking velvet coat and everything, there was no physical evidence left in regards to this case. It was all destroyed. You wanna talk about cover up? Okay, because I think there's something going on there, isn't there? Because in order for um, evidence to be destroyed, an officer has to prove that the case is no longer open. The sergeant assumed that because the case had been forgotten like over so many years, they must have just assumed that it was closed and then they destroyed everything. I bet you after those cops got arrested, I bet you that's when it was destroyed. I bet you. That was their reasoning as to why it was destroyed. Great answer. Oh yeah, it's just been sitting here forever taking up space, so uh, it must be closed. Let's destroy it all. So the sergeant, this new sergeant, she realizes this error and she's like, now I have to rebuild this whole story. So she calls up the FBI. She's able to get the coroner's reports about the victims regarding the case. It's not everything, but I mean, it kind of helps. They go back to the, the victim's families and they ask for pictures and clothings, items, just things in hopes to, to build profiles around the victims. But the families, that's when they find out like everything's been destroyed and they're like, what the 
fuck are you guys doing? Again, they have no trust in this system because you guys destroyed all the evidence. The sergeant, she's able to gather a lot of notes and paperwork regarding the case and she just tries her best to rebuild everything. But unfortunately, there's just no physical evidence any longer, which is a huge loss. And I just feel like that's not even the proper word because it's not even a huge loss. It's a tantamount loss, whatever the hell that word is. Uh, it just... So they're reworking on the case with no physical evidence and they're the FBI profilers, they start again and they're able to like build a profile as to who they think this killer was. They believe that whoever he was was a psychopath. We probably could all determine that, but yep. Most likely hated women. They thought that this person had to be between the age of 27 to 32 at the time of the murders. Most likely held a day job. And whoever this person was, was overly confident. They were abducting these victims between 6 to 10 p.m. when usually at this time everybody was home, like they would come home from work, start having dinner and stuff, kids are playing outside. So it was just not an ideal time to abduct anybody because the chances of getting caught is very high. It's very ballsy of them. Um, they believe that it was possible that the killer actually knew some of the victims and that they were able to gain their trust because of how quick it seemed to happen. And then based off of the dump sites, I hate that dump sites. That's a, that's a term that they used. It just sounds so like, it doesn't sound nice. I don't know. Anyways, based off the dump sites, they were able to determine that the killer is, is most likely familiar with the area and most likely comfortable there as well, which makes them think that they probably lived in the area, right? Maybe they worked in the area. Maybe it was just a location that was important to this killer. They felt safe enough to drop people there. So unfortunately time passes, still no leads. The new sergeant who opened, reopened the case, she retired in 1994 with no closure and no arrest made. To this day, the freeway phantom killer still remains a mystery, yep. Law enforcement 100% dropped the ball on this case by destroying the evidence. Some believe that they just wanted to get rid of this case in general and cover their tracks for not solving who this person was. But I think that's safe to say because technology has evolved so much that this crime could have been solved. There was DNA like on the victims, freaking those fibers, the let the note maybe. I mean, this crime could have been solved these days and it's it's just so unfortunate that these shitheads destroyed the evidence. They fucked up big time. Prince George County Police are still actively investigating the murders of all six Freeway Phantom victims. If you have any information, please call Prince George's County Crime Solvers at 866-411 tips, T-I-P-S. Like I said in last week's video, people like to talk. Us humans, we like to talk. No secret ever stays a secret. You know, somebody has to know something. Somebody heard something. Somebody knows something. Somebody, somebody knows. And if you know, please come forward and call the Prince George's County Crime Solvers. Let these victims' families get some goddamn closure, please. Look for the shoes. Where did the shoes go? Shoes? All the shoes were missing. Where'd they go? The shoes. Someone's gotta know something. I'm sorry to do two back-to-back -back unsolved mysteries, but these two were just heavy on my noggin last week's and this week's. I was like, how does this one go unsolved for this long? How did they fuck up that bad? The police department? Like, give me a break. Anyways, I would love to hear your guys' thoughts down below. I wonder if this person is still out there. I wonder if they struck again and we just didn't connect the dots because for some reason people don't like, the, like to connect dots. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Please make good choices out there. Other than that, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. You make good choices. I'll be seeing you guys later. Bye.